Welcome back, everyone, to Beat the Big Guys. Hi, I'm your host, Sandy Rosenthal, and today my guest comes from the wonderful state of California, more specifically San Francisco, and her name is Kristen Tiesch. Hello, Kristen. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Uh, we're going to ha have a fun conversation today talking about one of my favorite animals, the bat. And Yay. The bat there. Are. Yes. So I... <laughs> I can't wait to get started, and uh, but first I want to um, tell my my uh, our listeners just a little bit about you before we get started. Is that okay? Go ahead. Okay. Kristen Tiesch is an award-winning filmmaker who tells stories about wildlife, sustainability, and climate change. Kristen's films provide viewers with immersive and visceral experiences that inspire action and transform minds. She is known for her award-winning short films, including Forms of Identification, 2011, The Spinster, 2013, and Velo Visionaries, from 2015 to 2017, and an award-winning series about cycling and cities. Good, good. The Invisible Mammal, her first feature documentary, is currently in post-production. And of course, that invisible mammal is our friend, the bat. So uh, Kristen, take it away. Please talk to our listeners about what you're working on. Sure, so um, The Invisible Mammal is a feature documentary about bats in North America. And specifically, there's a, uh, there's a deadly disease that has decimated bat populations across the continent. Um, from uh, from northern or from the northeast all the way to the south and across Canada as well. So um, the disease is called white nose syndrome, and our film specifically follows um, follows a, a team of female scientists who have an ingenious project to help save. The bats in North America, so to help them survive the effects of white nose syndrome, and so uh, the film's central question really hangs on: Will they or won't they find a solution? And we get to go to some really amazing um, corners of the continent to see them uh, bring this project to life and go into caves with them, into mines with them, um, into all the places where bats will hibernate over the winter. And um, and then, you know, hopefully at the end of the film, uh, we'll see if they have found a solution or not. So for a lot of our listeners may not be aware, you know, why do we care? Why do we want to save the bat? Well, we do want to save the bat because bats are our friends. I mean, a lot of people think about bats and they're afraid of them you know, or they relate them to Halloween and vampires and rabies and all of these bad things. However, bats provide us uh, so many ecosystem services, which basically are, are benefits to us as humans that we get for free. So one of the things, especially in North America, that bats give to us for free is uh, pest control. So most bats in North America are bug eaters. And so if we, you know, so I always like to say, if you like tequila, if you like mangoes, if you like avocados or chocolate, you can say thank you to a bat because those are the, those, uh, that's the pollinator. Bats, you know, are pollinators. Um, bats pollinate those. And I just switched to another ecosystem service without realizing that I did this, but bats pollinate um, those plants and those uh, products that we eat, you know, eat and consume. Um, but then, yes, they're also bug eaters. So if so, the American agriculture industry saves billions. I mean, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars a year uh, in pest control. So bats will eat the bugs that will eat the crops. So, you know, corn, cotton, um, rice, uh, so many, so many different crops that are grown in North America. So bats at sunset will leave their roosts and fly over these crop fields and eat all of the moths that would then 
eat the crops. And so this is a way that bats actually save farmers billions of dollars every single year. So the other ecosystem service I already mentioned was pollination. So those, the, there's certain crops that uh, bats pollinate that we love. So we can say thank you to the bats. And then the other thing that people don't think about is uh, seed dispersal. So in places like a rainforest, because we don't really have very many rainforests in North America, um, we have some temperate rainforests, but um, in the tropical rainforest down in, in the Central and South America, uh, bats will eat seeds, they'll eat fruits, and then they'll eat the seeds and the fruits. And then when they fly across the rainforest, then they'll poop out the seeds. And then those seeds will go back down into the forest, um, the ground, and uh, new trees will grow back. So they help reforest deforest, deforested areas. Another thing that I like to talk about um, is that uh, guano is a great fertilizer. And it, you know, it used to be one of these very valued uh, fertilizers and people would sell bat guano, so bat poop. Um, but if you have a bat house on, you know, if you put up a bat house uh, in your backyard um, and there are enough bats uh, in your area, you could certainly fertilize your garden with, um, the, with the guano that falls from the bat house. So it sounds to me like while the, the citizen at large, um, and I can point to a lot of people in New Orleans that are afraid of bats for all mm -hmm. of these reasons we've mentioned. But it, it's sounding to me, however, that um, industry, like the agriculture industry, understands the value of, of the bat populations. Is that right? Yeah, they do. I mean, if, you, if you've ever seen a bottle of Bacardi, it has a bat on the label, and that's because they understand that bats are our friends. And so, um, so the bats, you know, basically will help the sugar, sugar cane producers, you know, because they eat the bugs. <laughs> it's another crop. Um, and so, you know, bats are basically, you know, very helpful to agriculture, the agriculture industry and, you know, many of the products that we enjoy. So the white the white nose disease, I'm sure that's not the official term. It's um, called white nose syndrome. syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Right. I can oh, talk yeah, more. You want me to talk more about that? I can. I can um, explain. Sure, sure. And then and then we're going to get into well, what's causing it. Okay. So, but yeah. first, what is it? Well, um, basically, white nose syndrome is a disease that's caused by a fungus, and so there's a fungus called PD, and there's a Latin name to it, which I don't remember. So I'm just going to call it PD. <laughs> and um, the, PD is a fungus. It's kind of like, so, you know, anybody who's had like arthritis, uh, uh, what is it called? Anybody who's had um, athlete's foot, you know, knows what a fungus is. So it's itchy and it's irritating. And so what happens is that during hibernation, um, when bats go into hibernation, it's uh they go into caves and mines and other types of hibernacula and the fungus spreads in cold environments. Mm. And so the fungus will spread uh, across bat populations within the hibernacula. And um, it's called white nose syndrome because when the scientists first found bats that were infected with this fungus, they found it on the nose of the bat. So they call it white nose syndrome. And so there's a difference between the fungus and the disease. So the fungus causes the disease, but the disease is what happens when a bat is in hibern hibernation and they have this fungus and they keep waking up because the fungus is, you know, is irritating. And when they wake up, they realize they're hungry, right? And they go out in the, in the winter when there are no bugs to eat and there's no food. And so every time they wake up out of hibernation, that burns a lot of their fat reserves. And so if they wake up more frequently because they have white nose syndrome, that means that they're burning through more of their fat reserves than they would if they didn't have this disease. 
And so when they go out to find to find food because they realize they're hungry, there isn't any. And so these bats end up start, starving to death. And that's what's been happening. Biologi biologists have been going into uh, caves and other types of hibernacula across North America. And um, they've been finding, you know, entire bat colonies just absolutely decimated. So like 90% of the bats are dead. So what's causing this fungus to infect the, these, the, the uh, hibernating areas? Yeah, so, um, so the fungus was first brought over probably on the shoes or clothing of a human. Um, so somebody, it, it's, it was present in Europe but, and, and Eurasia as well. But those bats have evolved over time to, uh, to just live with the disease. And so they don't succumb to it. But the bats here, it was a new, it was a new fungus, something that, they, that the populations of bats were not uh, familiar with. And so they hadn't yet evolved to, you know, evolved to withstand the effects of whiteness syndrome. So it was first brought over here and fungus spreads, you know, it's just one of those things that fungus do, yeah. <laughs> or fungi do, um, fungi spread. And um, in the hibernacula, bats will huddle together. They will um, go, they'll hibernate together in groups. And it could be, tens of thousands of bats. It could be hundreds of thousands of bats, right? And so it's just kind of like at a preschool when one kid comes mm -hmm. in and has and has um, some kind of a virus, you know, or some kind of a sickness, it spreads really quickly among all they're the kids. All together. They're yeah. all together. So, um, so the bats share caves with other bats and then they migrate. So the reason why it's spreading is that bats migrate. And so then they bring the fungus to this to another cave and then they'll bring it to another cave and then another bat will get it. And then that bat will bring it to another cave. So it just keeps spreading. So now the fungus is present in 40 states and eight oh provinces. Wow. Right. So um, uh, in 2019, it was uh, detected. The fungus was detected in California. And um, so now it's basically coast to coast, north to south, east to yeah. west. And so what is the plan to eradicate it? So um, because, because bats go into hibernation, into caves and mines um, and underground, uh, underground caverns, um, sometimes it's really hard to explore. Uh, you know, you, you'll never be able to find all of the bats in this one in this one uh, in this one cave or mine, um, because they go into little places that humans can't really go to, and so there's no real way to vaccinate them, you know, or to treat the fungus, you know, to go in there because there's no way of getting to the entire population. We're also talking about some caves like holding like millions of bats. Like this is you know it's almost impossible, but. Um, and also bats can't wear like PPE, you know, they can't wear masks or they can't social, they can't do social distance, distancing, you know, so they don't, they don't really understand that. So the, so the best way, which is the way that the scientists in the film that I'm, that I'm currently making, um, is to help them survive, like give them what they need in order to not perish from the disease. And so this is the actually the most charming part of my film, besides bats being really cute, um, is that the name of the project that they have that they came up with is called Operation Fat Bat. So it just the idea of a fat bat in and of itself brings, you know, cute images to mind of like little, you know, pudgy creatures flying around in the sky. So, uh, but this is basically the idea is um, they want to help bats before they go into hibernation, they want to help bats get fatter. So they're trying to create um, situations in which bats don't need to go very far to forage for the big, fat, juicy moths that they like to eat that will get them fat enough to be able to survive winter. They can, if they have white nose syndrome or if they, um, if they, you know, if the fungus is waking them up from their torpor, they can, they can burn through the fat each time they wake up 
but they will still have enough to make it to the spring when there are bugs around and they can go forage again because they're really hungry after that hibernation. <laughs> well, yeah, like I mean, everyone knows about the bears. They come out mm -hmm. hibernation and they're hungry. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure the same is for a bat. So so the, the what is the goal of, of your film? I mean, we talked about how agriculture understands why the bats are important. Um, so what, what do you hope to accomplish with your documentary? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the thing is, is that, is that often people don't know how, just how amazing bats are. You know, they're the only mammals that can fly. You know, they're also these long lived, tiny mammals some of them live up to 30 40 years wow. you know they have one baby per year so they they you know they give birth to one one baby not a litter you know not like a dog or a cat or you know a, like a, a mouse um or a rabbit they have one baby per year so this means that if we're losing 90 to 95 99 percent of our of certain bat species they may not recover in our lifetime or in our children's or grandchildren's lifetime. It's going to take a long time. So it's basically waking up, uh, waking people up to the need for one for conservation and to create, you know, to create more wild spaces for wildlife to flourish. Well, that's one goal. You know, the other goal is just to understand even further, like how amazing these creatures are, you know, in, in 2020, uh, COVID hit and people pointed the finger at bats and there was a renewed fear of bats. Like, you know, people were blaming bats and people were going out and killing bats and it was really sad, but, you know, they actually, they're, they're these actually super immune creatures. They hold actually like I think over 200 different types of coronavirus, you know, but they don't succumb to coronavirus. And so why is that? So scientists are trying to learn more about bat super immunity to help us better uh, resist and uh, overcome diseases and pandemics that could affect us as humans. So it's just it's learning how to how to coexist better. You know, the, there's 1,400 different species of bat, over 1,400 different species of bat in the world. They're all around us, and we don't even know it. I mean, I tell people here there are bats, you know, living right across the street from me in Golden Gate Park, and people had no idea that there were bats living in San Francisco you know, and they're here and they're eating bugs and there's several species of them and they don't ever harm us. They're just doing their thing. They're actually helping us. And so when people see bats in a new light, so if they go into the theater and they're able to watch a bat flight, I mean, my film, we've filmed in some incredible locations. There's some incredible places where you can go see a bat flight all across the United States. One of them being in uh, San Antonio, Texas. It's a it's a cave called Bracken Cave, where there's 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats that live there in the summer months, and they it's a maternal colony, so the mother bats have their babies there. And in the summer, it, you know, at sunset, you can go out and you can witness 20 million bats like emerging from this cave and circling around forming this vortex and then going off and flying over the fields. And it's just one of these, one of these natural wonders that once you see it and experience it, you're just like, wow, you know, it's, it's unlike anything that you've ever seen. And so when people see that on the big screen, we're hoping that they're going to want to go out and see a bat flight, that they're going to become more curious about these creatures that they've, that many people have never even seen before in the wild. Do you wonder yeah. if people are seeing them but don't realize they're bats? They think they're birds? I mean, unless you've got binoculars, it may be hard to, to see what it is. I think it would be even hard to see bats. Yeah, it would be even hard to see bats with binoculars. So uh, bats come out at night. So they come out, you know, at sunset um, or after sunset, really, like in blue hour most of the time. I think in... In the south, you know, and at places like 
bracken cave, it's pretty clear what it is. It's a bat. But sometimes they come out and, um, you know, it's 830 and it's the light is dim. So it's like blue hour and they fly. <laughs> sometimes they're flying 100 miles per hour. Uh, you know, the Mexican free tail bat is actually at 100 miles per hour, wow. the fastest mammal on earth. So they're flying so fast. Sometimes you just don't even see them. So if in the summer it's months, when hard it, to appreciate something you can't see. Exactly. They're yeah. invisible. <laughs> now, oh, so, oh, the invisible mammal. That's right. <laughs> but we so need they're invisible need and, and they're invisible in a way that people don't understand. They don't even know about all of the ecosystem services that they provide to us for free. You and, know, and, and you're afraid of them. That 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 fear is is irrational. It, it started a long time ago. I mean, as a little girl, um, I was taught to be afraid of bats. Um, yeah. I, in fact, I remember I thought all bats um, were blood sucking bats. Right. And so there's only one, you know, one like, well, I think there's maybe one or two types of vampire bats. Like 1400. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and they're all in like Central and South America and they don't, yep. they did not interested in humans really. They're, they, if they usually will um, eat, you know, or they will do like a small bite on a cow's ankle and the cow doesn't even know that it's there. You know, and, and then and my it. understanding is one of those bats is tiny. I mean, a teeny weeny little thing that you yeah. hold in your hand, barely. Just, yeah, they're thing. all they're all tiny. They're yeah, most well, bats. Yeah, most bats are just a few ounces. And so right. when we're talking about fat right. bat, we're talking about like, you know, maybe ten ounces, twelve ounces, or right. something. You know, a bat that's just and it very it's very small and all small all bats look like they're babies but they're actually full grown but they they will fit in the palm of your hand right right <laughs> and this but this blood sucking bat was a tiny tiny bat i saw mm -hmm. it on jimmy kimmel or something right i and mean, they had to zoom in yes to even see it it was so small exactly so, so the these so what's the biggest bat species on the planet um, so I think that those are the flying fox and there's also like, a hammer, yeah, there's like a hammerhead bat in um, Africa. The mm -hmm. flying fox is in Australia, I believe. And I think also Africa, I think there's flying foxes. I, I can't remember which is the bat species that has the huge migration in Namibia that one day I would like to go Namibia. see. Uh -huh. so um yeah, but the the flying fox um, in Australia is, I, I believe, the the largest bat. Mm -hmm. I know bats don't make good pets, but I've dreamed of having a bat as a pet. Yeah, <laughs> but I under, I've been I've, I've read enough and seen enough to understand they don't make good pets. Well, I think that yeah, I think that you know you you they you know they live they're different you know they're <laughs> you can't w go walk about you know you it, they fly and they um they poop a lot they poop a lot and so you know there's that <laughs> so you'd have you'd have to i mean there are people that have um there's like a bat uh, conservancy in florida called the luby bat conservancy where you where they actually keep a uh, fruit fruit eating bats um, and people can go there and you can see, you know, those big bats up close, you know, the bigger fruit eating bats are not native to North America, but they have some there. And so you can see how they keep bats. I mean, you know, as domestic, you know, creatures. Um, but yeah, the, I wouldn't imagine that they make, <laughs> they make good pets. <laughs> I never will get bad, but but I'm I'm interested in them. I, I understand how important they are to mm -hmm. our ecosystem. I'm not afraid of them. I do, uh, recently a a building a school uh, had to be all they had to empty all the kids out and bring in people because a bat colony had decided it liked the attic. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, oh well, what about the bats? You know, right about the bats are they going to save the bats are they going to relocate them what are they going to do and I mm -hmm. promise you I was in the minority yeah um, I worry yeah I mean most yeah bats still get they're still very misunderstood um understood. you know if something like that happens I mean what you you know and there are bats in your home and 
you know, it's understood if you don't want bats in your home. I mean, you know, they, like I said, they poop and you know, they can smell, but they're, they're really, you know, not going to hurt you. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, but if you don't want them in your home, then you should just call the local like wildlife rescue and just say, Hey, there's some bats in my home. And, you know, I'm not sure I want them there. And there are some very humane ways of moving the bats outside your home. You can also buy a bat house. Um, you know, you can put a bat house outside and they just want somewhere nice and cozy to, to sleep. Um, they just like to, they just like to, they like cozy places. So an attic makes for a nice cozy Perfect sense. bat habitat. <laughs> I love the idea of a bat house. Um, I was, I live in a um, uptown New Orleans and I was strongly considering getting a beehive. Mm -hmm. And then um, I also am very interested in the idea of a bat house too. I love, I love both of that, of those ideas. So who would you yeah. say? Agriculture gets it. Agriculture understands the value. Are there any large communities uh, uh, or uh, conglomerates uh, that that uh, believe that bats um, should all be eradicated and um, and and that, and that their mind should be changed? I don't mean the citizen at large, like my next door neighbor. I mean, um, you know, are there any you know p power decision makers who need to be um, shown the truth? Well, I, you know, to answer this question, I think the truth is that we really need to support bat conservation and bat science. So, you know, it's not necessarily trying to change decision makers, but to, to shift the attitudes, you know, towards conservation and to help the scientists who are out there in the field doing work to save species. I mean, you know, really we're, we are in the middle of an extinction crisis just recently. I mean, I think it what was it two years ago, but scientists, scientists were saying it was 1 million species at risk of extinction on planet earth. Now they're saying it's more like 2 million species at, at risk of extinction on planet earth. And that includes three species of bats in North America, the little brown bat, which is, you know, used to be um, the most common species of bat in North America, now is at, at risk of extinction because of white nose syndrome. White and if it syndrome. wasn't for these scientists that are doing this incredible work on the ground, trying Operation to find solutions, fat Operation Fat Bat, trying to find solutions to help these bats survive you know, they, they would go extinct within our lifetime. So I think it really is going, you know, rethinking about, you know, rethinking your attitudes about bats and then shifting, you know, funding dollars towards bat research. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's what is needed more funding, government funding towards bat research, because it's a, it's a type of animal that we know very little about just because they fly and they fly at night and they're so small, it's hard to, tr it's hard to track them. People, you know, some scientists don't even know where they go. Sometimes if they leave one roost, they're like, well, we don't know where they go next. And, and so, they don't make a sound. They, they, they don't, don't make sounds make. that we can hear. They don't make okay, sounds we that we hear. can hear. Oh so, yeah, they make okay. yeah. They they uh, communicate with each other at high frequencies, you know, which is mostly unless you're a small child, like above the range that the human ear can hear. Right. I mean, I mean, owls fly at night, but you can hear an owl. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and the they're bat. and owls are bigger, <laughs> and you can you can tag an owl, or you can chip, you know, put a chip in the owl. But a, a bat sometimes their bodies. You were talking about. They're so small, like you can't put a chip in them. They're just too small to do that. So, um, so anyway, so this, these are the reasons why, um, you know, we need to shift more funding dollars towards bat research. And hopefully the film that I make uh, will have that kind of an impact. Well, well, thank you for standing up for the little critters. I'm going to <laughs> my batty house and um, we're about out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we sign off? Uh, sure. I mean, if people want to find out more about the film, they can go to uh, www.theinvisiblemammal.com and you can learn about, um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook and find out about when the film will be released in your area. And there's also a place where people can go to support us by making a donation. 
Thank you so much. It was really a delight to talk to you, Kristen. And thanks to all of you. You're welcome. And thanks to all of you, our listeners today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording. Stay with me.